Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Ferrari. I am a senior research fellow here at the Berkeley Center. And on behalf of the Berkeley Center, I'm very happy to introduce this session on um, of Professor Michael Walter. So I, um, I'm not sure you need introduction, but I will make one anyway. <laughs> so um, Professor Walter is Professor Emeritus um, of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. And he has played a critical role in reviving discussion around ethics and war and ethics and politics in general. And we are here with my colleague, Professor Radova, to um, discuss and exchange on his most recent book, which is called The Paradox of Liberation, Secular Revolution and Religious Counter Revolutions. That was published at Yale um, this year, last year. This year, yes, this year. Um, so uh, the format will be the following. Um, Michael will present his book and thesis. I uh, will engage in a conversation with Chris and Jose, who is also could also join us. Let me introduce also Jose Casanova, professor of sociology here at Georgetown, and my colleague as a senior research fellow at the Berkeley Center, and of course, expert on secularism <laughs> and religions uh, and the global age. So um, we want to make this the most uh, casual and conversation as we can. So I will uh, respond, bring Jose into discussion, and have a broader conversation on the question of what is religion and what is politics today, and then we will engage in Q&A with you. So, um, is that okay? Can you hear me? Um, so, uh, what I wanted to do was to understand the appearance in the world, the unexpected appearance in the world, of religious zealots of a quite radical kind. Um, and I, I decided that one way of doing this would be through an exercise in comparative politics. Um, I chose three countries, India, Algeria, in which the, the secular left had won um, uh, quite strong victory. Um, in the aftermath of World War II, three national liberation movements of a leftish sort, more left in Algeria than in Israel and India, um, succeeded in establishing a, a state was a major triumph. And then 25 to 30 years later, this state was challenged by uh, a militant religious, three different religions, three different countries, but roughly the same, the same timetable. And so um, I, I wanted to ask, what happened to national liberation? Or um, I wanted to address an anxiety that I have, that some of you may also have, about the the, weak, the current weaknesses of the of secular liberalism and secular leftism. So that was my um, that was my aim, and. Um, that was the question that I started with. What what happened to national liberation? Um, and if you the situation now in these three countries is that Hindu nationalists are in power, 
in India, moving cautiously so far, but with a clear determination to make India into something more like a Hindustan than a secular state. They haven't won a definitive victory over the Nehruvian secularists and liberals, but my what happened question is central to both academic and political debates in India today. In Algeria, after a brutal civil war in the 1990s, the radical Islamists have been repressed, but certainly not defeated. Many observers believe that if there were free elections, they would win again, as they did in 91, and as similar groups would probably do in other parts of the Middle East. And in Israel, the Messianic Zionists of the settler movement are an important part of Netanyahu's government, and so are the ultra-Orthodox, the Haredim. These two groups have different agendas, I'll talk about that later, but they are equally opposed to the kind of state that David Ben-Gurion and the old Labor Party militants uh, aimed to so these, these aging militants of national liberation, they're, they're my age, and I meet them when I've, I've been to Israel and India, not to Algeria, but I've met some of these aging militants of national liberation, and they, were, they are surprised, more than surprised, by the religious revival. And I think we should share their surprise, even if we no longer believe as they did that history is on our side <clears throat> these days. In all three countries, the liberation militants accepted the academic theory of inevitable secularization, which was also a popular leftist theory. <coughs> all the liberationists in my three countries and in many others believed it. So Nehru, in his book, The Discovery of India, published in 1935, wrote this astonishing sentence. Some Hindus believe in a return to the Vedas. Some Muslims believe in an Islamic theocracy. These are idle fancies, for there is only one way traffic in time. Only one way traffic in time. The traffic patterns have gotten a little more complicated. Ben Bella, the first president of the independent state of Algeria, sat in a French prison reading Malraux and Sartre. He would never have dreamed of spending his time with Muslim sermons or treatises. David Ben-Gurion's agreement with the ultra-Orthodox to exempt their kids from the draft reflected a, a similar mindset. He thought they would be like the Mennonites and the Amish uh, in the United States, a tiny group which Israel would graciously tolerate and accommodate. The Jewish state would be ruled by free thinkers, that's his own description of himself, by free thinkers like Ben-Gurion. But along with this confidence in religion's eventual disappearance, the liberationist militants were also actively hostile to the existing religion of their people. The liberation they had in mind was twofold, from the foreign oppressor, the British, the French, and also from the oppression of the Hindu, Jewish, and Muslim religious tradition, and from the old religious authorities, the holy men, always men, the sages and scholars who had accommodated the foreign rulers and who ruled themselves over the everyday life of uh, the people. Now, I should note that this second liberation from religious authority was also supposed to be, in all three of my cases, a liberation of women, for women were, in each of these three religions, radically subordinated. Franz Fanon, the leading FLN, Algerian FLN intellectual, provides the best example of this in his many writings because he says it again and again. The freedom of the Algerian people 
is now identified with woman's liberation with her entry into history. And again, in the movement, the woman ceased to be a mere complement of the man. Indeed, it might be said that she pulled up her roots through her own exertions. In the Algerian case, the liberation of women didn't last very long or reach very high. The FLN had and still has its own glass ceiling. Still, women in the cities gain new opportunities and new freedoms, <coughs> true also of women in India and Israel. In his novel, Old New Land, Theodore Herzl, the founder of the Zionist movement, described a society in which men and women would be fully equal and in which they would be, both would be conscripted for national service, as in Israel today, though the equal status of women in the Israeli army is now challenged unexpectedly, I keep using that word, by the religious revival. Indeed, all three religious revivals are driven, in part at least, and I think in large part, by the fear of those self-uprooted, liberated women who claim equality with men. Of course, there are women among the revivalists who don't want equality, women who apparently are comfortable with rigidly divided sex roles and even with subordination and exclusion from public life. Think of the many young women, including uh, many young women among um, ultra-Orthodox Jews and among Islamists in all of the countries of the Middle East. I'm not going to try to explain that. I'm not sure that I know how to explain it. There are some easy explanations that I don't much like, false consciousness, brainwashing, which are unsatisfactory because they absolve us of any need to come to grips with the appeal of extremist religion. In any case, I want to ask more generally, what happened to liberation, woman's liberation, and everyone else's? Or perhaps better, what has happened to, what has gone wrong with the cultural reproduction of the secular left? I was giving this talk once in New York, and when I uttered that sentence, someone from the audience shouted out, you should be concerned with the physical reproduction of the secular left. <laughs> Go there. <laughs> so how can we explain the persistence of the old religious culture? Well, actually, the religious zealots are something new, more modernist, more political, more ideological than anything in the three traditions. But I think they feed off of the persistence of or the revival of traditional piety, which was, after all, the piety of most Hindus, most Jews, and most Muslims. So in a very important sense, the liberationists were at war with the people they wanted to liberate. And that's the, what I call the paradox of liberation. And I want to say that the paradox is there. It's a, it is paradoxical in all three cases. Um, I want to insist on the similarity of the three, although some early readers of my book have questioned this. In India, when I visited there and tried out this argument, the comparison with Israel was readily accepted. The Indian National Congress and the Israeli Labor Party are really very similar political formations. But the Indian intellectuals I talked to hated the comparison with Algeria. One of my Yale University Press readers wondered if the Zionist case was comparable to the others, given the years of exile and the conflict with the Palestinians. But what I am primarily interested in is the internal relation between the liberation militants and their own people. So I'm not writing about Hindus and Muslims in India or Arabs and Berbers in Nigeria or Jews and Palestinians in Israel-Palestine. Although I think it's important to say that the Palestinians have gone through exactly the same process without achieving a state or without yet <coughs> achieving a state. A radically secular liberation movement has been challenged by a religious revival. So the far left, militantly secularist and Marxist popular front for the liberation of Palestine 
and also Fatah today are challenged by Hamas. And Hamas, which I once thought represented the religious revival in a pretty extreme way, is now being challenged by jihadi Salafis allied with ISIS. So what went wrong? That question reveals my own sympathies, but it's a question a lot of people are asking. And clearly, there are answers peculiar to each case. The religious revival in Israel would have taken a very different form without the Six-Day War and its accompanying triumphalism. For then, we would also be without the occupation and the set settler militants. Hindutva in India would probably be less powerful without the series of wars with Muslim Pakistan. But I want to focus here on causes directly related to the liberation struggles. I want to address features of liberationist ideology that led to, and I don't mean anything as strong as <coughs> determined, but led to the fierceness of the religious response. And I think there are two factors that can help us understand what has happened, what is happening. The two may seem inconsistent, but they actually stand together. First, the radicalism and absolutism of the secular militants, and second, the internal weaknesses of secular culture. The first of these is perhaps best illustrated by the idea of newness. The liberationists aimed literally to create a new Jew, a new Algerian, a new Indian. Ben-Gurion <coughs> wrote that the most important contribution that the labor Zionist movement has made is not the new ideology, but the creation of a new type of man. And Fanon said virtually identical things about the new Algerian. The rejection of everything that was old was a feature of each of the movements I'm looking at. According to the liberationists, the religious tradition, the old culture made for weakness, passivity, fearfulness, and accommodation with foreign rulers. The stooped, frightened, exilic Jew was a Zionist stereotype. Indian nationalists condemned the docility, docility of the conventional Hindu. Newness, by contrast, was identified with secular strength and vitality with the pioneer, but also with the warrior. If you look at the iconography of the early Zionist movement, you will see the new Jew, man and woman, side by side, young, tall, muscular, handsome, very opposite of the exilic Jew. More than this, the liberationists believed that there would be, that they would create a new culture to go with the new men and women. Remember the effort of the French revolutionaries to create a new culture for Republican France, a new calendar, uh, unfortunately organized on the decimal system with a 10-day week and only one day of rest. It didn't, didn't appeal much. But also new holidays, civic oaths, a wonderful festival of reason that Robespierre presided over, and much, much more. But it didn't take, not in 89, not in 1848 either. The liberationists in India, Israel, and Algeria did better, I think, with their new holidays, new heroes, new songs and dances, poetry, novels. All this worked pretty well for a generation or, or two, and then it didn't work, or it didn't work well enough. It was very attractive, the culture of liberation, but it was at the same time too thin compared to the traditional religion. One example, which seems to me particularly important, the old religion marked the life cycle, providing occasions and ceremonies of celebration for birth, coming of age, marriage, and rituals of mourning for people dealing with the death of loved ones. <laughs> Secularists did not do well with any of these occasions. <clears throat> Perhaps some of you have experienced, as I have, those awful, awkward moments at a secular funeral where nobody knows what to say or when to weep. My own conviction is that those of us sympathetic to Hindu, Jewish, or Muslim liberation have to find our way to an engagement. It would have to be a critical engagement with the, <clears throat> with the historic culture, which is to say with the traditional religion in an effort to create a thicker 
and more enduring liberalism or left. A new culture that connects with rather than negates the old culture. Consider this example of the project. There is an organization first established, I think, in Algeria, active now across North Africa and in India, too. It's called Women Living Under Muslim Laws, W-L-U-M-L, -L, not a great acronym. This is an alliance of secular and religious Muslim women who search in religious texts for arguments against the gender hierarchy and find them. That is, they find texts that can be interpreted in an egalitarian way. They deny that there is a single Islamic tradition authoritatively interpreted by male scholars, hence the plural in their name. But women living under Muslim laws, there's more than one way of reading Sharia. And many of these women are learned enough to make the, to present the re-readings of the tradition with scholarly force. Something similar has been going on in the Jewish world with feminist scholars producing wonderful new readings of biblical and Talmudic texts. Um, a recent book by Uma Narayan called Dislocating Cultures argues for a similar effort among Hindu women. Maybe this sort of thing wouldn't have worked early on. Maybe the first liberationists had to be absolute in their rejection of religion. But I think that this engagement may be the best way of responding now to the religious zealots. I think I'll stop there. I would like to, to provide some um, points or counterpoints based on the research I did about the building of the nation state in Muslim countries and the um, emergence of uh, politics of Islam um, right in the aftermath, actually, of the, of the building of the nation states. So I will take your two factors, and, and primarily the first one, when, when you talk about the radicalism of the secular project against religion. From what I have um, observed in the nation state building in the 40, project, the culture of the secular elite was uh, radical against religion, but the reality of building the new nation was actually um, much more nuanced and complex when it comes to uh, at least Islam, which is the, the, the religion I've been studying here. What do I mean? I mean that at the end, uh, the secularization process in Muslim lands starts at the end of the Ottoman Empire with the intrusion of the French, the British, the Russian into the Muslim Empire. And you see here different trends emerging, including like you compare with, with other cases in your book, including this very secular westernized elite that wants to get rid of the bad influence of religion on the political participation or engagement of the people. And uh, Ataturk, the founder of Turkey, is a very good example of that. His model comes from the West. His secular project is very influenced by the French laicite. What happened is Ataturk will create the nation from scratch. There is no Turkish nation before the end of the Ottoman Empire and before the Treaty of Sèvres. So we are not here on a pre-existing communal identity and sense of belonging on which this secular um, elite could build on. <coughs> and that's why the project was radical in the sense that it was also a very intrusive authoritarian project. None of these people, I'm talking about Muslim lands, it's different from India, it's different from Israel. All, all of them were authoritarian. It is also part of, I think, of the issue here. And 
they had to built a new sense of collective identity that was completely unknown to people. Same thing in Pakistan, same thing in Tunisia, same thing. I mean, the only country that has a pre a preliminary collective identity were Iran and to a certain extent Morocco. But otherwise there is no nation. There are different regions, different ways of, of dealing with your Muslim, regional, uh, family, uh, cultural, linguistic belongings, but there is no nation. So it means that at this stage, um, all of these secular elite, despite, 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 sorry, their despise of religion. Uh, uh, Bourguiba was an atheist, could never say it. He could not care less about religion. But what all the, uh, uh, Saddam, Saddam is, uh, was also a case in point. They were all atheists and very cynical vis-a-vis -vis religion. They all built a nation that put Islam at the center of the national identity. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that the first thing that all these secular rulers did, that didn't exist in free modern time, they nationalized the religious endowments, the uh, clerics became civil servants, the mosques came under the control of the state, the uh, religious teaching, even for the people who are going to become professional clerics, is controlled by the state. All this didn't exist in the Ottoman Empire. Of course, the caliph could go back and, uh, you know, and incite. <laughs> and inside, you know, religious validation of some politics, but the caliph didn't control the ulema, the caliph didn't control the mosque, didn't control the religious institution. This change, Kamal Ataturk, yes, Turkey is secular in the sense of having removed religion from public space. The first thing that Kamal Ataturk did was to nationalize the dominant trend of Islam the Sunni Hanafi dominant trend. Same, Nasser did the same thing. He nationalized El Azhar. El Azhar was a major Islamic university for the global Muslim world. It became an Egyptian institution. The president, until the 2011 revolution, nominated the Grand Mufti of Egypt. The caliph never nominated the head of the religious you know, establishment, never. That's what I'm saying. Of course, the people, the idea was to control and to use this religious identification of people to build the sense of a new nation. But it's like, you know, um, uh, opening a, a deus ex machina here. So, and, and I completely agree with the weakness of the secular culture because there was no secular culture really transmitted in any of the new state institutions. For example, if, if Turkey was really secular, Alevi, Kurds, Christians would be recognized as equivalent to the Sunni citizen. They are, this is in the discourse. In the reality, you have process of discrimination. If I am an Alevi today in Turkey, I cannot have my religion taught in public schools but I have to go through the Sunni dominant teaching that is paid by the state into the so-called secular public schools. So that's what I think there is a problem here in terms of, of what happened in the internal relations, as you said, between the secular elite and their people. The goal was to control, was to take advantage of the Islamic identity to build a new nation, but the, the final product was not indeed a secular liberal project. So you, you talk about uh, the main point is really this negation of pluralis, plurality and diversity. Uh, as I said in our conversation, if I were a Greek Orthodox in Istanbul, under the caliphate, the historical real caliphate, I could leave. Of course, I was not equal because it was never a secular system. You know, there was no secular system to start with at the time. But I could exist and I was part of the ummah. The, 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 the whole territories under the rule of the caliphate. 
once the nation state is built, I do not have a legitimate status as a Christian in the new nation. And you, that's why you have also all these movements of population between Greek, Greek and Turkey. Same thing in Pakistan with India, with the movement of population, because the idea was to create a stock of homogeneous people who belong to the same tradition, who speak the same language, who partake in the same kind of lifestyle. But it, it, it could not completely eradicate the diversity in the reality, in the political project, in the socialization project, it is. Another point is that in all these countries, indeed, you're absolutely right. Women got equal rights. Actually, all these secular projects advanced the rights of women in education, in employment, in social life. One point that the secular left under the role of religion is family law everywhere, which means that <laughs> not in Tunisia. It did, you're right, but if I look at the majority of countries, family law was ruled by Islamic principle. And the two exceptions are Tunisia and Turkey. But even, so it means that marriage is under Islamic rule, divorce is under Islamic rule, we create an inequality between husband and wife until now. This is a big, big project, a big challenge of what you refer to as a Muslim feminist. How do I gain this equality that I have in other domains and that doesn't translate into my family life? And this was a secular uh, project. This was not a religious project. So the, the reference to Sharia as part of positive um, law or Islamic prescription inscribed into a secular legal system is the outcome of the nation state. That's what the Islamists picked on to, to ask for more Sharia. The, 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 the political project of Islamists is a direct consequence of this building of an entity called a nation in which Islam becomes a center, the cement of not only the public life or the social identity, but also the national identity and the civic identity. And I think that's part of the problem here, in the sense that even if today this generation you are referring to may be appalled by the outcome, the Islamists are the illegitimate children of this secular project because its radicalization didn't go to an eradication of religion. Actually, it went with the project of redefining religion. And I don't think that the tradition, as people are, are claiming it now or trying to connect to it now, is the same <coughs> tradition than before the nation state. There has been in, here I talk, I'm talking about Muslim countries only. The consequence is that the nation state has broken down the Islamic tradition. Uh, and it's also part of the problem why we have so much radicalization and excess in projects like ISIS or Al-Qaeda. Um, so I, I will stop here and uh, um, so in, in, in the world, the, the secular were radical, but they, they created a form of Islam that I call hegemonic Islam that is the basis for the politicization of religion in the, in the next generation and in which we are now. Again, I do not pretend to explain all your cases, but for the Muslim countries, I know, including Algeria, that's, I think, something argued. Okay, let me begin by saying that this is a wonderful book and that uh, I'm glad you wrote it. It's a difficult book, I think, for you to write is a kind of a, self-attempt to come with your own secularism. And it's somewhat, a, that I find the argument somewhat convoluted. Uh, at the end, I mean, I think you brought very clearly what it is that you want to do. Uh, it could be called, I guess, the book, The Unfinished Project of Liberation. But it's unclear in the end whether you mean national liberation, secular liberation, or democratic liberation. I think uh, we could say that in our global age, 
the unfinished project of liberation will have to be a post-national uh, uh, and a post-secular uh, liberation, the way in which uh, Habermas talks of post-national constellation or he talks of post-secular societies. I do not agree fully with Harvard, but the point is that if we are going to continue the project, the unfinished project of liberation, uh, it will have to be certainly a post-secularist one. And this is, of course, what you are implying with your notion of, of the dialogue, the negotiation between uh, secular and, 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 and religious traditions. So. This is sort of the end, the punch line, which I'm going to bring at the end, but I wanted to bring it at the beginning. Um, Jocelyn's comments point to the uh, somewhat uneasiness in the comparative, the comparison of the three cases. Obviously, Algeria, Algeria is one among many, many Muslim countries that could be, and this is what, she, what Jocelyn has done. Namely, uh, Algeria is only one of the many Muslim countries where you have a secularist revolution followed by religious counter revolution. Uh, interesting enough, you have some Muslim countries today where you have secular revolutions followed not by religious counter-revolutions, but by a democratizing Islam that leads to a new form of democracy. Let's say, let's talk of uh, Indonesia to a certain extent, even Tunisia to a certain extent today, one of the f few uh, successful cases. And you could say Turkey is still undefined. Obviously, the problem is not Islamism in Turkey. The problem is uh, Erdogan's megalomaniac uh, uh, wanted to be a new Ataturk. But it's not the question. I don't think that Islamism is a problem, let's say, today in Turkey, the, counter, the religious counter-revolution. So the question is, on the other hand, Israel, there is only one Jewish uh, uh, state, so it's comparable. You don't know. Uh, and there is only one uh, Hindu state. And so we have a very a, a kind of a, a, an even cases, and, they, and yes, they are comparable because you point out what unites all three of them is basically what you, uh, uh, let's me write from one page 141. It is what unites them, it is the political passion and the elitist condescension of a revolutionary vanguard that finds itself at odds, sometimes even at war with its own people. This is what unites the three cases. But of course, the context of the national liberation is very different. Uh, precisely because uh, the ingathering of the diaspora Jewish communities all over the world into Eretz Israel is very different from the liberation from colonial rule in the case of Alger, which is simply, again, as pointed out, yeah, simply one of the many, many Muslim regions which are under colonial rule, and the British colonial rule, which actually is what makes the project of Indian independence a project in itself. So if there is an Indian na nation forming the subcontinent, it's made by the British project itself, not, and this is not the case of the Jews. You could say that it is only the case of the repeating nationalism and the anti-Semitism and the nationalism throughout Europe produced that basically produces the Zionism as a, as a, but it's very different from the two different types of colonial rules against which then the project of national liberation emerged. And I'm saying this because you could say in the case of Israel, it's almost, almost impossible that the secularist project could succeed. succeed. I mean, once you call it uh, 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 for two reasons. One, because it is not simply a liberation of a territory from colonial rule. It is the gathering of people from the outside coming to occupy the country, which is already occupied. And ultimately, the name uh, uh, Eretz Israel is the one that legitimates the occupation. Uh, to a certain extent, it is the paradox that my, my friend Amnon Ross Krokotkin always repeats. The paradox of uh, 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 Jewish secularism is God does not exist, but he promised us the land. <laughs> and ultimately, it is this that legitimates the occupation. And therefore, while the, while the Uganda alternative will have to fail. But once you have it, it is, it is, and once you do that, and then once you add the reconstruction of the sacred language of the Bible, Hebrew, as the language of the new nation, not Yiddish, which was the more natural language for all the people that came from the ingathering of the people from Europe, but Hebrew. And you could argue once precisely, they don't care less, the, the, the Zionist leaders, but they give the monopoly of religion to the Orthodox, 
which is very different from what happened, of course, in the United States in terms of the different forms of reform and conservative Judaism. So you could say there is a, a, a series of accumulations that make uh, uh, the story almost inevitable. Of course, what it makes inevitable is the, the conflict with the uh, uh, Arab nations around and with the Palestinians, and therefore the transformation of Jewish secularism into Zionist religious secularism, which of course is not yet uh, traditional Judaism. I mean, the original millenarian uh, Jewish Zionist secularism is a response to precisely to the context of the wars in Israel. And it's only later that you would say the, how to integrate the Haredim, the Hasidic Jews that were anti-Zionist. It's added to this, but they are two different things. Let's say the emergence of a Jewish religious secularism, uh, excuse me, of a Jewish religious nationalism, millenarian one, which now was to settle the entire uh, 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 land of Israel, and how to integrate the Haredim uh, into the Jewish state are too uh, complicated. My point is that, yes, we have things in common, and what is in common is the reaction against secularism. But the context within which this reaction takes is also very different. In the case of India, I would argue it is precisely because pre the modernizing elites decide to use religion to mobilize religious communities against, let's say, uh, uh, British rule. So religious communitarianism is not something traditional that has always been there, but it's really a product of the mobilization that the modernizing elites decide to do. So again, it's very different from, let's say, the Chinese modernizing elites. They decide to get rid of every Chinese tradition because it is feudal, because it is superstitious, because it is, pre we have to. So the attempt of the modernizing Chinese elites to smash temples and build the schools, and basically science and religion, is very different from that of the modernizing elites, let's say, in India. Nehru may be the most uh, radical secularist, but obviously the other leaders of the movement. Gina, yes, Gina actually is the atheist. The atheist is Gina. But of course, Gina is the one that wants to use religious communitarianism for his own project of state formation. So what I'm arguing is that it is the religious mobilization that is being used for defeating British rule that creates the, the dynamics themselves. So it's true that in the three cases you have counter-revolutionary religious dynamics, but precisely because the dynamics themselves of national liberation are very different. Also the dynamics of why uh, uh, it becomes inevitable. And this is why it's very important to see in other places in which the secularist counter-revolution doesn't lead to precisely the religious counter-revolution in the same way. Now, Throughout the text, there is, uh, is you, sometimes you use secular in the sense of secularist ideology. Sometimes you use secular in a more neutral sense. I mean, the difference between a secularist a state project based on a secularist philosophy of history, this is a one-way street, which has a very clear telos after religion, is very different from a secular state project, which I think was actually the original uh, project of, of India, not Nehru per, per se, but the way through compromises with Ambedkar and with Gandhi and with the others, a secular state, although it was not called secular then, the secular was, was only added in the constitution through uh, by Indira Gandhi in the uh, uh, state of exception, the military state of exception. But it was precisely a secular in the sense in which the American state is secular, not secularist. There's no secularist ideology. It's a state which is made secular precisely to avoid either the majoritarian rule of one religion, is the privilege of one religion over others, and precisely to allow religious pluralism to, 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 to function. It's imperfect, obviously, uh, uh, Indian secularism. But in this respect, one doesn't need to be post-secularist in India in the, because the one doesn't need to be post-secular in the same way in what, when one needed to be post-secularist in Israel or in Algeria to incorporate, to accommodate the majority of the population that were not really uh, a part of the project, or at least it was getting rid of their religion that was part of the project. <coughs> so the need to differentiate between secularism as both a 
philosophy of history, secularist ideology, and secularism is a state project that basically wants to put religion in its place and create a laicist public sphere free from religion. It's very different from a secular state that is there precisely to allow religious pluralism and freedom of religion, which I think is the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, liberation project that still needs to be uh, continued in many places in the world. Finally, ultimately, it is whether the language of liberation itself that uh, implies precisely a before and after, uh, which is very much linked to a modernization break. I mean, I'm a sociologist. My discipline is basically an ideology of modernization. I would say today, a theory of modernization in which is a radical break between tradition and modernity. But it's an ideological co construction. We know that there was a lot of modern already in the pre-modern cultures, a lot of tradition in the post traditional, there is not a radical break. And of course, when it comes to a state formation, uh, uh, I think Tocqueville here is probably the most interesting anti-modernizing uh, uh, theories of uh, modern democracy, because precisely he points out how much the project of a state formation is a continuation of the absolutist state, continues the centralizing dynamic of the uh, uh, traditional absolutist state into the post-revolutionary state. Obviously, Marx himself takes the same argument in the 18th Brumaire, how every revolution only uh, strengthens the etatist project. It started, I mean, he, he takes up the, the, the argument of Tocqueville and brings it into the revolution of 1830, 1848. But then why then the final liberation project would get rid of the state is a, is a, if, if you wish, is a, is a, a, a mystery. So it is the modernist myth itself, which ultimately uh, uh, of this radical break with the past. Now what you are saying is obviously this is the, the greatest mistake. There should have been a dialogue. So the question is not so much a liberation from tradition, but a reforming of tradition, which was what actually the successful modernization in most European countries was. It was not a break with tradition but whether we took of the United States, whether we took of the Scandinavian countries, whether we took of the, of the, of the UK, and with the exception of France, where you have really a revolutionary attempt to get rid of, of tradition. Uh, the process of modernization in most uh, successful European modern countries has not been this radical break, has not been this liberation, has been a much more process of reforming tradition. Even when they thought that they were really getting rid of Christianity, because how Christian, those secular, I mean, probably there's no other more Christian nations than the Scandinavian countries. They are perhaps very, very religious people, or they are very secular, not religious, but they are very Lutheran and very, 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 very Christian. <laughs> and so the question is uh, that it is very, very uh, problematic, this notion of, 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 of secular, what secular means. And I think that uh, uh, this somehow commitment is still to the notion of liberation is what I find problematic. To a certain extent, uh, it goes back to the very image of Exodus in the critique of Said to your previous, again, okay, wonderful book on Exodus. Well, yes, it's a liberation from Egypt, but it's occupation of already an existing occupied land that demands a lot of violence to get rid of the, of the existing. So there is always this, this uh, um, problem in the uh, dynamic or in the language of liberation, which always implies a superseding, a denying of the past, a denying of other people, or even the very monotheist superseding of paganism, the uh, Christian superseding of Judaism, the Protestant superseding of Catholicism, the Enlightenment superseding of religion, all these supersedings are continuation of this project of liberation. And my question is whether should we not read uh, get rid of the very concept of liberation and superseding and precisely begin the project of conversation with uh, 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 those, this thing we want to reform. Okay. I, I would like to give my phone to Ken. And then I open the floor for questions. Well, <laughs> um, I'll just respond to a few things. Um, First of all, I, I, I um, on one of my on a visit to India, um, one of these aging uh, militants uh, said to me, um, 
Nehru was too much of a British liberal. What we needed was an Ataturk. Um, well, that didn't work either. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I do agree that there is the, the Muslim Muslim revolutions or transitions have been much more authoritarian. Um, and I, I, the, I, I thought of, of writing also about a, s a couple of authoritarian secularizations, Ataturk and Lenin. Um, but I, uh, and, and then Algeria could have been included there because Ben Bella immediately established a one party state. <clears throat> Incidentally, with French Trotskyist advisors. <laughs> um, but I, I, I included the Algerians with India and Israel because there were genuine Democrats, pluralists in the FLN. Many of them went into exile um, after the supposed success of the movement and then came back in 1991 to compete in the elections. Um, and there actually was a Democratic Socialist Party in 91, which carried the Berber districts, but um, lost to the Islamists, to the Islamic Salvation Front in most of the, in most of the country. So it was, it was those FLNers that I was really comparing to um, the Mapainiks in Israel and the um, congressmen in India. Um, now, the, the central argument of both the, my commentators, critics here, is that the um, secular liberationists really had no business being surprised. They are themselves the authors of, um, or the, they, 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 what they do leads directly to um, uh, the religious, um, the return of religion in, in this new, new zealous modernist version. And that's an argument that's been made by Perry Anderson, the editor of the New Left Review, in a series of articles then collected in a book. Uh, he compares India, Israel, and Ireland um, and makes a very much the same um, argument that, um, that uh, the, the, the national liberationists are compelled to evoke the primordial nation, and the primordial nation is a religious nation, and so they lay the groundwork for um, the, the uh, zealots who come, um, who come after. Um, and I, I, I think there is, there is something to that view, but I want to defend the, the possibility of, I, I want to defend a certain view of the liberationists that has them, that make, the, that, that, that sees them as genuine secularists. And I'll, I'll use the Jewish example, which is the one I know, I know best. Um, there is this, this problem um, that, the, that the adjective Jewish modifies both a people and a religion. Um, and most most Americans, when I talk about the Middle East around the country, most Americans think that a Jewish state is like uh, a Lutheran state or a Catholic state and not like a Norwegian state or a French state. And that's wrong. And it's a very important error. Um, Norway is a, is a secular state with a national church, a Lutheran church. But um, but it is um, but no one thinks that Norway is a religious state, even though ninety percent of Norwegians are Lutheran. Um, and the, the the Zionist labor Zionists aimed at exactly that kind of of division. That Israel should be a secular state, even if most of its inhabitants were Jewish. Most Jews are not religious, so um, it, uh, they, they had they they had um, uh, they had a, a possibility of uh, of creating um, a, a, 
a state like all the states. Um, and, um, and some of them even imagined that once you established a Jewish people with a state of its own, then some of these Jews would be Baptists, Presbyterians, <coughs> Muslims, Buddhists. Um, they would be Buddhist Jews, Muslim Jews, because the Jews were a people. And just like the French people, there could be different religions among the people. Now, that turned out to be a fantasy, um, although there are Buddhist Jews. Um, <laughs> But it's not, it's, it's a, it is the fantasy of the founders. This is what they, this is what they, um, they wanted to do. And when they compromised with religion, um, they did it because they were so sure that religion was fading away. That, that, that the compromise was, was um, easy to make because the victory of science and reason was guaranteed. Um, well, they were wrong about that, but, but that, that, was the, that was the view. And I think it's not quite right to say they gave monopoly religious power to the rabbi. Of course not. They, they maintained the millet system. Of course. They gave family law is in the control of Muslim authorities, Christian authorities, and Jewish authorities. They didn't challenge. They didn't challenge, they didn't attempt a, a, a civil law, partly because, as I said, they thought religion was fading away, and partly because it would have outraged the Muslims as much as, as, much as the Orthodox Jews, and they had no need to do that. Nehru made a similar compromise, civil law for the Hindus, but Sharia family law for the Muslims. Uh, that means um, liberation for the Hindus and <coughs> religious liberty for the Muslims. And that was a compromise also based on the belief that, that, that the religion would, would, um, would fade away. Uh, you're right to say Gandhi evoked Hindu uh, motifs in the nationalist movement, <coughs> which Nehru hated. Um, and contemporary um, Indian secularists, my age, uh, blame Gandhi for the religious revival. Um, well, there's, there's so much more um, to talk about, but uh, I, 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 I do agree that liberation will be post-secular. I, I don't think in in it will be post-national. Um, I think we need to complete the project of national liberation. The state for the Palestinians, the state for the Kurds, this, a, a decent state for the people who are now living in indecent states. Um, Post-Westphalian world is very, very far away. My name is Yossi Shein. I'm a professor here I'm the founding director of the Center for Jewish Civilization here. I want to, first of all, congratulate Michael for his book, and maybe raise some issues both with you and maybe with uh, Jose Casanova, uh, a case I know very well, writing about for years, and maybe a word about the Hindutva, which I've been studying also. Uh, it is clear, Michael, that you're absolutely correct, that the founding father face of the nation has been to transform a people and to create a certain kind of ideology that will unite people sort of like almost ex nihilo on some uh, uh, position. In the case, I think, of Ben-Gurion, which you take as the founding father, was never divorced from religion completely, of course. It was rather making it civic religion, Judaism and civic religion. The revolt against was what you described is the old Jewish passivity. The old Jewish passivity in the diaspora required a new Jew. And the new Jew was, of course, when you add to that, so the socialist ideologies became kind of a secular. 
but it was never secular in that respect. It was Ben-Gurion who appointed chief rabbis. It was Ben-Gurion who said, we're going to go back to the biblical story rather than to the halakhic sort of rabbinic story of 2,000 years of exile. And in that respect, Israel was never in that respect secular, but it was taking religion differently. It was, of course, a revolt against the old passivity, which proved itself to be more, most dramatically, I think, in the Holocaust. I would say one word. If you read Guy Ben Porat's latest book, which you may have read, which talks about the secularization of Israel. Now, this was just published from Cambridge University Press. To think that Israel is becoming more religious, if you have the data, is absolutely ridiculous. Israel, when I study it day in, day out, is becoming all the time more secular. There is a response of the religiosity to the secularism. When I grew up in Israel, and I grew up in Israel, everything was closed on Shabbat. Everything is open on Shabbat now. Everybody's on the beach. Everybody's eating. You cannot find one kosher restaurant in, not only in Tel Aviv, in most cities in Israel. In Jerusalem, it's a different story. It's the hub of the Haredis. They understand. But may, may I ask you to? But what I'm saying is that the data is a completely different data. The secularization, which didn't exist in my generation when I grew up, in the post-Palestine era of my parents who grew up in Palestine and were born in Palestine, is a completely different lifestyle. You know, the dilemmas are different. But it is true that now, and, and this is the big question that they raise, is it the occupation? A word that is kind of like post-67. It is also ridiculous. On the contrary. The, the religious party that belongs to Netanyahu's government that you mentioned, Bennett's party, is having women, secular women in their midst, uh, completely modernized, high-tech people who reject the old religious Zionists. These are who they are. That's why they have so much power. They bring religion in the back door, but it is not religiosity. The Haredi is indeed what you said, is re reproduction. Ben Gurion thought it's a, it's a tourist attraction. And lo, lo, lo and behold, they deliver seven babies per family. And seven babies increase very rapidly. When I do my surveys, a man who is 72 years old in Israel of an ultra-Orthodox will have 42 descendants. A man who is a secular will have only 12. And a man who is religious Zionist will have 18 or 21. That's the difference. But then you get 1.1 million Russian Jews coming secularists. So I think it's kind of like it's the anxiety of the labor Zionists that you have on the land, on the issue of liberation. This is a good anxiety, but I think it's unwarranted in that respect. And certainly I completely disagree with Jose Kananova about the whole issue of the occupation. It's a completely wish wash kind of like interpretation of Edward Said that has no meaning to this development. It may have other meanings, but not to this development. Thank you. I would like to take a couple of more questions. Please uh, try to go to your point. Please. Uh, hello, my name is Nadia Oweidat. I teach a class at Georgetown on Islamic thought, and I'm a fellow at New America. So my question is to all of you, actually, is how do you think of the Arab Spring and the debate on secularism, especially given what's been happening in the Arab Muslim world since the Arab Spring? And I'm referring to the debate on secularism on the online. So the top, uh, all the top most watched uh, forums, et cetera, are secular. And they're calling for both definitions of secularism that uh, Professor Casanova referred to. Thank you. One more. Uh, I suppose my question is, why did you include Israel in these, these post-colonial, post-World War II countries like uh, Algeria and India, wasn't it the world wars that stimulated this, along with the Stalinist and Soviet revolution and Lenin in the previous war, that stimulated this so-called secular uh, modernism, which led to these really anti-colonial or post-colonial revolutions, which, although they had conflicts within really focused back on their previous uh, 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 owners, if I can call it that. And the Israeli thing is a bunch of uh, people who came in from outside, as you, as you and others have pointed out. Nothing wrong with that, except they are different people. Thank you. So I'm going to give you. You should respond to the Arab Spring. Yes, I will, but you have a lot of questions. Well, I mean, I included Israel because I think the relationship between the um, Zionist 
militants and the Jewish people is very, very similar to the relationship between the Indian Congress militants and the Indian people and the FLN militants and the um, Algerian people. The peasants? Hmm? The peasants? Peasants. There are no peasants. The Jews were not peasants. This is an internal relation between the militants and the people they are claiming to liberate. And it, 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 ideological. Well, it's not just ideological, because they actually do. They create states, and, the, and they rule for some period of time. Um, and, they rule in, um, and they rule with a great confidence that they know what is best for their people. And that is the same in all three, in all three cases. Let me go back to this. I'll do it. Yes, it's another wrong project. Well, I mean, as I mentioned, obviously you have Tunisia is one thing, Egypt is another thing, and then you have the mess of uh, Iraq and Syria and so on. And I guess I mean, uh, Tunisia is the interesting case, obviously, because uh, it was too small a country, it was left alone by the geopolitical uh, powers that be. And they could come find out their own compromise precisely because you have a reform Islamism through Ganazi and Nahada, the party, that came to terms. I mean, the kind of uh, really dialogue between secular feminists and, 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 and Muslim feminists that were crucial for, for the constitution making, right? It was a, it was a, a compromise constitution with secularists and, and Islamists. Uh, none of them won and they compromised. Uh, constitution process, and the Islamists lost elections and uh, left, uh, and now they are still in coalition with, uh, with the new government. So it is, in this respect, a success story, and I think that it, it was right for the Nobel Prize to, to, to reward them for that. Egypt, I would say, we, we think too much in terms of Islamism and secularism. I think, that basically, for me, I look at it as more comparable to Argentina under Perón. You have basically a majority party is going to win elections. You have the, the military, and you have then the minority Democrats that ask the military to come to save us from the majority rule. Because they, whenever you have elections, the, the Islamists are going to win, but they are not very liberal, so the Democrats feel that they are being discriminated. And so it becomes an impossible game. But ultimately, it's the military. It's a military dictatorship. And, 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 and it's a, a, so I, I, I think we have to be careful how we put the emphasis on, on, on secularism versus versus Islam. The others, it's a mess that was created by the by the by the U.S. Uh, uh, intervention in Iraq, which has radically radically made a mess of the whole Middle East, and uh, and we don't know how it will finish. If I can add one 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 thing on the Arab Spring, I think the whole discussion around the Arab Spring was very typical of this so-called opposition between secular and Islamist. You know, the whole, if we, if we take today the discussion on Islamism, it's always presented as religious movement opposing a secular state. And when we think secular, what do we think? We think from our Western habitus or experience that there is separation between religion and the state, that there is privatization of religion, and that there is decline of religiosity. And we think that the secular state in Muslim countries embodies these three principles. It has never embodied these three principles to start with. So this is the whole problem. So actually, the secular state has had all its all the engineering of the, of the society and the national identity was with Islam. There has never been separation, never privatization, no decline of religion. So what are the Islamists then? What is the project of the Islamists? Is it then what, when they say we want an Islamic state, what's the project? Is it to create uh, uh, Sharia as the, relig the, the law, not only for civil law, but penal law, uh, criminal law, economic law. We, we, the, it's, there is no real project of Islamists, except their um, attempt to challenge the authoritarian nature of the state. So indeed, people can call themselves secular. It doesn't mean that they do want to get rid of Islam. 
And, and that's where I think we are mistaken to look at Islam only as personal religiosity or, or revival in all aspects of life. It can also refer to a belonging, to, to an identification to a tradition that you can use politically without automatically having a, a religious, you know, as you mentioned, a, a, a theocratic project. I think that this is gone most of, in most of, of cases, unless you take ISIS and Al-Qaeda. But that's what you, call, you talk about post-secular. Post there is a term that was called post-Islamist, where people are referring to Islam not to create an Islamic state, but to create a social project in which some religious principle will rule uh, social organization. That's what I think is, is at stake. And that's what the Arab Spring was not about. The Arab Spring was not about Islam. It was about a rebellion against authoritarian states. And these rebellions fell most of the time because, because protest is not a revolution, because you need a real push toward transition and sharing of power. It didn't happen in Egypt. And that's the reason why it fell, not because of Islam. And that's why Tunisia is a success, because there was a real attempt to create a transition and build a consensus and a trust between the different protagonists. I actually would, I agree with you a million percent that the state has an active project to Islamize the nations. I am a product of this Egyptian consciousness, so I know it firsthand. There is rhetoric to the West, mainly. Yes, and absolutely. And, and the internal, like, yeah. who are educating their peers about secularism, real secularism in both its meanings, whether it's separation of religion and state or um, pluralism. So I see it as a really hopeful move forward because we have never had before people explain to us intellectually what secularism is. Because you say Almaniya, and you might as well say atheism, yeah. and even much worse. Um, Label. So I'm really referring to the new nascent, but it seems very powerful. They are getting numbers online. They are, and they are engaging their peers. And you know, 80% is under 40 in the Arab world. They are the most active online, more than any other segment on earth, in terms of um, posting, in terms of downloading. So I was wondering if you can say something to this promise. That's all. Thank you. With another, uh, I would like to take a few more questions. Yes. I had the privilege of taking a course from Professor Walser in the late 1960s. And um, one of the uh, principal aspects of the course was that we watched the film, The Battle of Algiers. Uh, this was, I believe the title was Terrorism? Well, yeah, it goes, <laughs> it goes back a bit. But in any event, uh, my, my question would be, would you want to jump back a little bit further and consider what, if any, religious or secular influence would have come from either France or England in India, Israel, Algiers? I mean, all of the um, liberation militants in my three cases were Westernizers. Um, Nehru spent eight years in English schools. Um, in, in, uh, in his last years, he, he told the American ambassador, John Kenneth Galbraith, I am the last Englishman to rule in India. <laughs> so, and he was, a, he was a Fabian socialist. Uh, Churchill called him a communist, but that was crazy. He was a, he was a Fabian socialist um, in, in a land where the vast majority of his people had no idea what Fabian socialism was. Um, ben Gurion was a Central European Social Democrat. Uh, Chaim Weizmann taught in Manchester. He was a British liberal. Um, the 
FLN militants were, they hated the French occupiers, but they were Francophile Marxists. Um, their leftism was the leftism of, of France. So, um, and that's, that's one of the reasons, maybe the crucial reason, why they find themselves at odds with their own people and, and why the, the, the task of the liberationists, which they sometimes attempted but never succeeded, was to naturalize the values of Western liberalism in the culture of their own people. And, and that's what they were not able to do. I think that's what a group like Women Living Under Muslim Laws is trying to do. It's, and, and the naturalization process is also a transformative process because once you, have, once you have taken the values of the French left and naturalized them in a Muslim country, they're gonna be different values. But they will be, they, 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 they could be, maybe this is what's happening in Tunisia, they could be the values of um, an, an, a, the kind of country that the original liberationists wanted. Yes. The, we've been talking about these developments in terms of national liberation and secular liberation, but what about the role of economic liberation here? Because as you mentioned, all of these leaders, all of these national liberation leaders are also socialists and they're engaging in this project at sort of the global high watermark of socialism in many ways. And they think that socialism and a new socialist society is part of what's going to allow for secularization, what's going to replace the ties of religion. So how much is this not a story about the failure of secularization, but the failure of socialism, and the failure of socialism in the post-1960s era which leaves a void which religion fills. Um, I think there's something to that story. Um, although, the, what happens in each of these countries is that the, 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 the people I'm calling the liberationists become a political party in the new state and they become the ruling party. In, in Algeria, the only party, or for a while, the only party. In India and Israel, they compete with other parties, but they are the ruling party. And they rule for the first 20, 25 years. Um, and what happens to them is what happens to all parties who rule that long. The, 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 the successor generation isn't the same as the original, they are, they are um, more, well, what, what sets in is, is what looks from the outside and is mostly accurately described as corruption. And the, the socialist project becomes sclerotic, bureaucratic, and um, over-controlling. Uh, in, is, in, in the Israeli case, I think um, the Mapainiks did very, very well in integrating the, the, the immigrants in those first years. Um, that required state planning. But in all these countries, the state planners turn out to be um, self-interested bureaucrats. And, um, and the, so yes, there is, that is part of the, part of the story. And if you, um, the, uh, the, 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 the ruling militants, the liberationists are um, bureaucratic and, and increasingly corrupt, and the Islamists or the Hindutva people are um, righteous. The feature of all the religious revivalists. Um, so that, that is an important part of the story. places like West Africa and Nigeria, I mean, Boko Haram, when they say Western education is a sin, I think that's read very differently here than it's read in Nigeria, 
which in Nigeria is read as these rulers who've come up and are squandering our oil income are all incredibly corrupt and we're all educated by Western institutions. So that's what makes the, <coughs> the, the problem is, is that they're not delivering, that they're seen as very, very corrupt and that's what's undermining the secular project there. Um, that's exactly what happened in Iran. How did the regime of the Shah felt? What was the reaction? It was it was it was a reaction against this corruption by a very um, educated elite, both religious and secular. Because we tend to forget that a lot of elements of the reaction of the Shah were also secular at the time. So I think it's a paradigm you tr you find everywhere. But the point is not to say that it's a fail. I don't think it's a failure of the economic project. It, it actually, the people who rebel against the state are the one who are the outcome of the state, were the product of the state. Think of the middle class in Tunisia. Ben Ali was the victim <coughs> of his success. So there is a strong middle class, and, and that's the one that rejected Ben Ali's uh, corruption and, and limit of distribution of power. So it, it's, uh, it's like exactly the colonial versus the post-colonial. You know, the, the, the post-colonial people rejected the colonial rule, and I think you can make this comparison. So I don't know if it's the economic project as such as the mismanagement through corruption and indeed mismanagement of bureaucracy and institution as such that, that is really responsible or to see religion as a response of the disenfranchised, this is not validated. This is not the response of the disenfranchised. It's more global and deeper than that about collective identity, about <coughs> soci pro social project in, in this sense. And it's led by the urban middle class uh, everywhere. Questions? Well, we have uh, exhausted you. <laughs> Anything you would like to ask? So I think um, it is important to stress the global the global reach of um, the return of religion and of appearance, uh, often of novel forms of religious delicacy. Um, it's not everywhere, but um, if you read the newspapers, you might think it's only in the Islamic world, and that's that's a that's a, one of the points of my book is to say it's happening in, in the Hindu world and in the Jewish world. Um, I think in the American world, <laughs> less so in the American world. It's happening in the Buddhist. We we all. Pacifists, and, um, but now there are marauding Buddhist monks who are quite violent. Um, so this is—it's a phenomenon that that really does suggest the, the the necessity for for those of us who think of ourselves as secular whatevers um, to worry about what what's gone wrong. What, what, why is secular culture, which in many ways is very attractive. Um, American commercial culture has global reach. Is, um, in some ways, the, re the religious revival is a reaction against the, the, the secular culture that comes out of the American, uh, that comes out of America. Um, but, but it is something to, uh, it is something to worry about. And it is a, pro a problem of cultural reproduction, and as we said, a problem of physical reproduction <laughs> also. One more, one more. Yes, I just wanted to, to make a small comment about uh, uh, the reaction against um, the American global reach. 
I think if you go to uh, Egypt today, you will find as many Salafis and Muslim brothers in McDonald's as anybody else. So uh, I agree that the global reach has a sort of innate corrupting uh, characteristic, but um, it's not something which is being rejected by the religion. Okay, well maybe McDonald's and Starbucks will save us. <laughs> 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 <laughs>